the first half of the century witnessed the emergence of a commercial civilization of great material prosperity. Foundations were laid in the peace and security which was won for the nation and in, and in the extension of its power and influence giving command of all the main trade routes. It was, however, a civilization which displayed all the evils of a society making haste to be rich. Extremes of wealth and poverty which had been impossible under an agrarian society were dividing the nation. The pursuit of commerce encouraged the development of cities and city life, and it was to the cities that the landless farmers migrated in search of a livelihood, where wealth, luxury, and vice dwelt side by side with poverty, misery, and squalor. With the exchange of goods went the exchange of ideas. New religious cults, standards of luxury and splendor, and materialistic aims of living, which had hitherto been foreign, were now introduced. If you think that I am giving you a brief thumbnail sketch of the last hundred years of American life, if you think that I am referring to the beginning of the 20th century, and what has transpired in this nation in terms of moving from an agrarian society to an urban society, moving from a society that was based on the farm, on the land, on agriculture, to a commercial urban society, you're partially right. Because I am referring to that and yet what I read you was not intended to refer to that. What I read you is taken from the introduction to the book of Micah in the Sonsino Commentary, which is a Jewish commentary. And those who wrote that commentary do not understand the identity of modern-day Israel. They have no idea, no conception, that the United States and British people represent the modern-day ten tribes of Israel. This commentary, this introduction to the book of Micah, was written, I, I left out, see, just a few words when I read it so as to uh, not give entirely away. The way that I, I read it, the first half of the century, I didn't say which century, they read it, it's written here, the 8th century witnessed the emergence in Israel and Judah of a commercial civilization of great material prosperity. They have reference here to the events that took place in approximately the last hundred years, the last uh, really about 75 or 80 years prior to the collapse and the captivity of northern Israel. Now the point that I want to bring out, brethren, and the reason I, I read this and I bring out to you, what we have here, what I've read, not only describes modern-day America, modern-day Israel, it describes ancient Israel, it describes our forebearers. It describes exactly what they went through, and when we go through and understand, have you ever wondered why, you know, the, the records, the, the things that are written down in the Bible, the, the minor prophets, let's take specifically, you know, those men were men who lived at that time, in that age, in that society, they had a message that had impact for their time. They delivered a message for their people at that time. Now, their message had an impact far beyond that day. That's why their message was set down so that we can read it and apply it in our lives today. That's why some of those prophecies are preserved in the Scripture. But to properly understand the prophecy and its implications for today, we have to understand the background against which it is set. We have to understand the background in which it was written. We have to understand the circumstances that they were writing in to really understand their message and then to understand it for us today. Because, brethren, when we look into it, what we find was exactly the same situation, exactly the same sins, exactly the same problems that were committed by our ancient forebearers. And we find God raised up a work, and he gave to them a message. And that same message, God has raised up a work to give today. Same sin, same message, same result. Because you see, Israel of old went into captivity. And there is a parallel 
Now, when we go through and we understand, and I, I want to, to kind of paint the picture a little bit for you, and to help you understand the parallel that exists. And the parallel that exists between God's work then and God's work now. The parallel that exists between Israel and, and the setting that they were in at that time, and the setting that they are in at this time today. And then to understand a little more fully the message and the impact of the message that God gives, particularly through three prophets, Hosea, Amos, and Micah, men who were contemporary with each other, men who were leaders in God's work at that time, whose messages have been set down for us today, and whose messages have a very vital impact on the times, the events that we, brethren, are going to be living through in the weeks, months, and years immediately ahead of us. And it's something, certainly, that we need to understand and that we need to comprehend. So I, I want us to understand the message and, and its implications uh, for us today. Now, there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn. If you want to, to get basically a survey of the history of the United States, you realize in 1790, which was the first year the census was taken in the United States, there were 600,000 families in the United States. I, I think that's interesting, you know, no great giant spiritual significance, but I think it's interesting. How many did God, how many, what, was, what population did Israel start off with when God brought them into the promised land? 600,000, didn't they? 600,000 men, 600,000 families. That's how, that, that's the population this nation started off with. And when this nation started off back in 1790, this nation was 90% rural. 90% of those 600,000 people lived on a farm. Now, we went through a change. Uh, the first hundred years, the change was moderate. From 1790 to 1890, the percentage living on a farm had gone from 90% to 70%. In a hundred years, a drop of 20%. Now, from 1890 to 1900, 10 years, all of a sudden it had gone from 70% rural to 60% rural. Now, in 1970, the figure was 25% rural. It began a very rapid decline by World War I. We were kind of on the balance. In the aftermath of that, uh, the population began flooding into the cities, and in the aftermath of World War II, it really multiplied as people came off the farms. We changed from a rural society to an urban society. Now, there came a multiplication of commerce, wealth, and urbanization, and they all go hand in hand together. You see, brethren, the message that, that, God, that God's prophets gave at that time were aimed at a people who were living a certain way, who were committing certain sins. They lived in a society which was geared contrary to God's way. And they are indicted for certain sins. They were committed for a certain way of life that they were living. Now, these messages have implication for us today because we are living the same way as a nation. We're committing the same sins. We're doing the same thing. Therefore, the message has impact for us, has meaning for us. There was uh, a history, if you want to go back to, to Israel. You know, it's interesting, from the, time of the, from the time Israel rebelled against the house of David and established its independence, that was approximately 922 B.C., it lasted 200 years, or just over 200 years, and then came the Assyrian invasion. 721 to 718, please, or actually, if you want to check it out, you'll find it was a three and a half year period. It was a type of time of Jacob's trouble when Israel went into captivity, when the nation was destroyed. That's interesting. You know, Israel of old rebelled against the house of David and established their independence under Jeroboam, the son of Lebat. And uh, they lasted as an, as an independent nation 200 years, or just over 200 years, approximately 200 years. You know, it's interesting, our forebears also rebelled against the house of David. Now, you know, interesting the reason. Why did Israel of old rebel against the house of David? Taxes, wasn't it? They didn't like the taxation program of, of Rehoboam. You know, Solomon's was bad and Rehoboam's was going to be worse. They said, you know, taxation without representation, you know. They sent their representatives and Rehoboam wouldn't hear them. Does that sound familiar? You know, have you gone back and you read the story of what happened? Same thing, see. 
We've been griping about that, and God warned through Samuel when the nation wanted to, when Israel of old wanted to set up an independent kingdom outside of the government of God uh, under, you know, human government. Samuel warned. He said, there are three things you're going to gripe about, and God is never going to give you any relief from it. You're going to be griping about taxes, you're going to be griping about the bureaucracy, and you're going to be griping about military conscription. And, you know, all of the things that go with those things. You can go back and read it. In the book of 1 Samuel, I, I'm not going to turn back there. I think I have gone through it before. You know, the first thing Saul did was institute uh, the income tax. Uh, you know, fourth tithe. You ever heard of fourth tithe? That's what Saul instituted. A 10% levy all across the board on everybody. And it went up from there. That's what they started out with, see. By the time of Solomon, they said the taxation is oppressive. You wonder how high it got. You know, if it started out that way with Saul, how long, in, in, in 120 years, from the beginning of Saul's reign to the end of Solomon's reign was 120 years, how high do you think taxes had gotten in that time? Probably about like Britain is today. So the people rebelled. They rebelled then, they rebelled in, in, in our day, and they set up a nation, and it's interesting, we've come approximately 200 years. You know, from the time that we rebelled against the house of David until the time of our captivity, I'm not setting any specific date. Uh, you don't have to use 1776 to start from. You know, that's when we started. It took us a few years to win our independence. You were all on up to, uh, what, about 1781, somewhere right in that neighborhood. And so we're, we're talking of an approximate 200-year period. I'm not setting some date things are going to work out, you know, exactly one way or the other. But I think we realize, and I don't have to go through a whole sermon to prove we're the last generation. And I, I can prove that, and I think there are many things that certainly prove that this is the end time and the end generation that God uh, is going to usher in the return of Jesus Christ and the setting up of God's government on this earth in our lifetime. So we're, we're talking of an approximate period of 200 years. And it's interesting, we started out with about the same number of people. We started out as a totally agrarian society with, you know, just a few towns, few cities. We have multiplied, and as the wealth and the prosperity multiply. And the time of, of this really began during the reign in ancient Israel of Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam the second, whose reign began uh, approximately 60 years before the collapse of Israel. Now, if you want to go back about 60 years, we're talking about the time period, you know, to, to parallel it with our times today of, of right after World War I that Israel began to achieve its real place. I'm talking about northern Israel. And, uh, you know, perhaps we haven't gone into and studied uh, history in the Old Testament enough to really, to, to really uh, glean the full impact of some of these prophecies and the parallels for our time today. But Israel, northern Israel, reached their pinnacle under Jeroboam II, who had a long reign of about 40 years. And... Uh, in the aftermath of Jeroboam II's reign, there were six kings in 25 years. It was a very unstable time period. And I think, again, it's interesting. You know, in the time period uh, since 1960, since Dwight Eisenhower, do you realize he's the last president to serve two full terms? Ever thought about that? You know, John Kennedy was elected and he was assassinated. Lyndon Johnson succeeded to his unexpired term, won a tremendous victory, and uh, then went right on to bog the nation down in the Vietnam War, and, and such internal strife and dissent was stirred up that he was finally virtually forced by the pressure of public opinion and by uh, the internal strife that had been stirred up in this country, he was forced to, to go uh, on, uh, on the networks and say, uh, I will not seek the nomination of my party you know, to run for president again. He was forced to step down. He served out his term, but in the midst of great uproar. If you remember the Democratic National Convention of that year, when Hubert Humphrey was nominated, the riots that shook Chicago and all of the things that took place, and the internal strife and turmoil as this nation was a nation that was being rent asunder, and a president virtually forced out of office. All right, then Richard Nixon came in. And he was, finally, completely forced from office where he became the very first man in the history of the United States of America to resign the office of a president. And he was forced to resign the presidency 
succeeded by Gerald Ford, who served out his term and then was defeated for re-election, which is a very rare thing. It's only uh, something that uh, uh, has only very occasionally happened in the history of this nation. And last happened when Franklin Roosevelt defeated Herbert Hoover during the time of the, Depre uh, of the Depression, and uh, something that uh, has very rarely happened. And he was defeated for he was defeated for election, succeeded by Jimmy Carter, who appears to be well on his way to being the first president in modern history who will not even be allowed the nomination of his own party. You know, he looks like he's on his way to being beat out. So we have had a very unnatural, unstable uh, setup in our government of just transfer, transfer, transfer. It's interesting. Israel of old did that. And the, Jeroboam II's 40 years of stability and then nothing but chaos and confusion followed. Six kings in 25 years. And all, and most of them um, of different dynasties. There were several assassinations and various other things. So it's interesting, you know, and I, I pointed up for parallel, not for you to try to fit every specific thing. I'm pointing up a parallel of general trends. And I'm not trying to draw a specific, uh, a specific parallel for every individual or, or every person. But um, the nation of, of northern Israel expanded during the time of Jeroboam II. They expanded their borders. They controlled the strategic gates. And as commerce multiplied, materialism multiplied. And there came to be many problems that beset the nation, that beset the people many sins that came to beset that nation. And it was something that brought it to the fore when, when God raised up his prophet. Now, Hosea, who was the first of those prophets, began his prophecy. Hosea began his prophecy at a period of about 50 years before the collapse of Israel. Hosea began his prophecy. Hosea and, and Amos and Micah were a little bit later, but during the same lifetime. Hosea's ministry was about a 50-year ministry. Interesting. It began at the time when Israel was reaching her peak, was just, you know, just at the point of attaining her peak of power. It began at that time and continued on down until captivity. Now, it's interesting. God raised up this work approximately 50 years ago, not yet 50 years, let's say about 45 years ago, God raised up this work, and this work carried a message to this nation a, a, at a time when this nation and when, when Britain were reaching the pinnacle of their power. We, as a nation, stood unchallenged in supremacy at the end of World War II. We possessed the bomb. We were the only nation that possessed the bomb. Britain also possessed the information. They had worked with us on it. We possessed the bomb. We had the army. We had the, the navy. We had the factories that were geared up. We had the world's strongest economy. The United States stood supreme. The United States and Britain possessed the vast majority of all of the world's wealth. We had the power to dominate and rule the world. This work. You know, it's interesting that this work really went nationwide on radio in 1945. Now, we had been a uh, daily part of the time during World War II. We had gone, uh, I guess, technically nationwide in the sense we began on WAI back in 42. And uh, I think WHO Des Moines and, and uh, whatever at various other times, and, and we reached a lot of areas in the nation. We went on XEG in 1945 and really began from that time forward to saturate the nation on a daily basis with the World of Mar broadcast during the closing time of World War II. And we were talking about, Mr. Herbert Armstrong was a lone voice crying in the wilderness that Germany will rise again. And some of you have been around this work going back, you know, for that 30 or 35 years, and some of you have plain truth. Going back and dated 1945, 1947, 1949, 1951. And there, there are articles there headlining 
Germany will rise again. And he was a voice saying that in 1945, when Germany was being pummeled, when Germany was being pounded out of existence, he was saying this nation had better repent or it is going to be defeated and carried into captivity. Taking the message of Hosea, of Amos, of Micah, those men began delivering their message at a time when their nation was standing at the pinnacle. And they began to give that message. Because you see, those people were committing certain sins. And God says, whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. Ask any farmer, you go and sow corn and what do you reap? You don't get broccoli, you get corn. You reap what you sow. As a nation, we have sowed certain things. And we, brethren, are reaping certain things and will reap certain things. Israel of old sowed certain things. And they did reap certain things. That is a matter of history. And there is an enormous parallel between our forebearers and our nation today. Let's Turn to the book of Hosea, chapter 4. Let's begin to see what God has to say for our people. Hosea, chapter 4, verse 1. Hear, hear the word of the Eternal, you children of Israel, for the Eternal has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. God has a controversy with our people because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. In other words, one, one violent act, one murder leads to another. You know, just flowing like a river. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwells therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven, yea, and the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Do we find that happening today? You think the fish of the sea are even being taken away? We've got an oil spill down off the Gulf of Mexico. The fish of the sea are being, are being taken away. The fowls of heaven, the beasts of the field are languishing. You know, we have polluted our nation. We have polluted our land, and we are destroying our heritage. God says, yet yeah, yeah, let no man strive nor reprove another, for your people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shall they fall in that day, and the prophet also shall fall with them in the night, and I will, and I will destroy your mother, or cut her off. In other words, uh, the religion of the people is vain. It hasn't done them any good. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you. That you should be no priest to me, seeing that you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. God says his people, Israel, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why lack of knowledge? Because they rejected knowledge. Our peoples nationally have not even acted on the things they know. They know better than what they're doing. Now, there may be things that they don't understand, but I'll guarantee you there are a lot of things they do understand. You know, 98% of the homes in this nation have a Bible in them. Ninety-eight percent of the homes also have a television set. That's an interesting statistic. Approximately, you know, just almost identically, the same number of homes possess Bibles as possess television sets. What do you think people, you know, what, what do you think is on the majority of the day? Well, what do you think those ninety-eight percent, how, how many hours do you think that ninety-eight percent spends reading the Bible as opposed to watching television? What do you think the comparison is? I think probably, you know, about equal when you read the Bible for an hour and watch television for an hour, don't you kid yourself. Probably a lot of those 98% would have trouble finding that Bible. Oh, yeah, they know where it is. It's on the table there under the vase, you know. It's got the little doily sitting on top of it with the flowers. You know, that's where the Bible is. You know, just where it is. You know, we dust it off every year when we have strange things. The outside, not the inside. But, oh, don't let that television set go out. Call the repairman. Get him here quick. An emergency. You know, it's midnight. The late movie's on. I'm going to miss it. you got to get here. You know, a house call. You wouldn't find them rushing down to the bookstore to buy a Bible if something happened to theirs. You know, they'd probably go a year and not even think about it. 
They can't do that with a television set. But, you know, God says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they rejected knowledge. Now, there is no lack of technical knowledge available today. There's all kind of knowledge. There is a proliferation of knowledge. But it is the wrong kind of knowledge. God says by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery and all of this kind of thing, by a rampant violation of the commandments of God. God says in verse 7, As they were increased, so they sinned against me. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. You know, our sins as a nation have... have uh, uh, multiplied in proportion to our blessings, the more God has blessed us, the more wealth we've received, the more of God's blessings that have been poured out upon us, the more corrupt we have become as a nation. The more our immorality, the more our greed, the more our covetousness, the more our sins nationally have multiplied. You can, run, you can run it out. You can go back and take the crime statistics and you can take the divorce rate and you can take various of these things and project them out from 1900 on up. And it is absolutely staggering what has taken place. God says, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. The more I've blessed you, the more I've poured out the choicest bounty of heaven on top of you. What have you done with it? God says, verse 11, whoredom and wine and new wine have taken away the heart. You know, whoredom, immorality, sexual looseness, which is a plague in this nation today. A lot of people don't even begin to take serious. And I'm afraid, brethren, some of this attitude even affects some of God's people and even some of our, uh, you know, we, we as parents certainly need to be aware because th that, our, that our children have God's viewpoint on these things. I want to tell you that this society, immorality is so rampant in this society, people don't even take it seriously anymore. There's no such thing as disgrace anymore. Whoredom and wine and new wine. You know, what are, what are people into today, to use the modern term? Well, they're into all types of immorality, and they're into all types of drug and alcohol abuse. You know, and, they, and it all, all the same category, in terms of drug and alcohol abuse. It takes away the heart. It's, you know, this is what people are caught up in. This is what the nation is saturated with. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declares for them. For the spirit of whoredom has caused them to err, and they've gone a-whoring from their God. Now, what is that talking about? They ask counsel of their uh, stocks and their staff. I want to read you a comment in the Jewish commentary. Their stock means the wooden idols fashioned by their craftsmen, their staff. Uh, so depraved of the people grown that they no longer consult the priests but have recourse to divination by stick. Now, when you check it up, what it's talking about, it's talking about astrology. It's talking about that kind of thing. Divination, all kinds of, you know, Ouija boards and astrology. Boy, astrology charts, you go in stores and they've got all these chains and pendants hanging around Pisces and Aquarius and, and all this kind of garbage. All this kind of thing, it's an abomination in God's sight. You can go back, you don't know, trace that kind of thing back to Babylon, and I don't want to get into I don't want to get into that part of it. But God said, you know, that's what happened. People don't seek to me for the way they ought to live their lives, they seek to their horoscope. They seek to, you know, uh in effect the all types of divination and fortune tellers and all kinds of, of demonism. And and this is the kind of thing that people are seeking to. The spirit of whoredoms has caused them to err. You know, just an absolute depraved state of mind. And I, I think it just sometimes it's hard for us to grasp the enormity of the sin that God looks down and sees, and the fact that it is an absolute stench in the nostrils of Almighty God. And I think sometimes we get so hardened to it, we get so callous to it, and we've seen so much of it on television, little things, that we just get callous to it. And after a while, well, you know, big deal. Don't 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 get shook up about that. I'm going to tell you something, brethren. God doesn't have that kind of attitude looking at it. But that rubs off on us, and we begin to not... It, it, it just is not that big a deal anymore, and we don't get that, that worked up about it. It doesn't bother us. And sometimes our children take it a lot more casually than we do. We take it casually enough, and they are bombarded by it. And uh, it just is something that, that we need to make sure that, that we have God's 
viewpoint on it because it is destroying a people. It is sapping our, it's sapping our vitality. It's sapping our national strength. We are destroying ourselves by what we're doing. We've rejected knowledge. Well, God goes on and talks about this kind of thing. Uh, he talks about verse 16, Israel slides back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Uh, well, I, I makes the point very plain in terms of what has transpired and what is transpiring in our nation. Uh, Hosea chapter 8, God says, set the trumpet to your mouth. No, that's, that's, a, that's a command to us. God tells his servants back in Isaiah 58, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their sins and the house of Jacob their transgressions. That is our responsibility, brethren. Set the trumpet to your mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the eternal because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know you. Oh, we're God-fearing folk. Oh, we're a godly nation. Ninety percent of the people in this nation believe in God. That's what George Gallup says. Ninety-eight percent of the people in this country have a Bible in their home. Oh, we're a godly people. God says Israel has cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They've set up kings, but not by me. They've made princes, and I knew it not, of their silver and their gold, that they made them idols, but they may be cut up, that they may be cut off. We set our affection on material things. Our silver and our gold are what's important to us. Money. Material wealth. God goes on to say, verse 7, They have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It has no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If, it, if so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. They're gone, gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim has hired lovers. You read about the Commonwealth Conference over in, in, in Lusaka, uh, over in Africa. You read about the Commonwealth Conference. Britain went there, you know, hat in hand to its former colonies. It hired itself lovers. Oh, they, they're tried to appease and to get allies. And oh, please, Nigeria, don't take away our oil wells that we have there in your country. Nigeria, you know, to, to show absolute total content that Nigeria, that, that Nigeria, a part of the Commonwealth, had for Britain, on the opening day of the Commonwealth Conference, Nigeria nationalized all of the British oil holdings in Nigeria. You know, that's just the way they started off. and say, hey, this is what we think of you, you know. Snub our, uh, snub our nose, uh, uh, snub, snap our fingers under your nose. We'll just show you what we think of you. And you better sit back and you better like it, buddy. Because we're not going to take anything off you. We don't, we, we don't have to put up with you. Israel is swallowed up. Israel has lost the pride of its power. Israel finds that the things God has given are draining away. And they don't know what to do. And they appease and they compromise. They've sown the wind and they'll reap the whirlwind. God says they're swallowed up. They'll be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. You know, we're an unpopular lot. The United States and Britain are not going to win any popularity contest around the world. We are among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Oh, they get a little pleasure now and then out of, uh, you know, hauling our flag down and spitting on it, or uh, nationalizing some of our property, or kind of thumbing their nose in our face. We're among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Well, what did Britain do? They went to Assyria. They go to Germany to bail them out. Ephraim has hired lovers. They're, they're, using that, they're using that North Sea oil, and they think that's going, to, that's going to win friends for them. God says, Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. Because Ephraim has made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. And it goes on down, verse 14. For Israel has forgotten his maker and builded temples. And Judah has multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Israel has forgotten his maker and builds temples. Doesn't that describe us? We've forgotten God. We've forgotten the true God and his law and his way. 
And oh, do we build temples. We build churches and we've got them coming out our ears. You can read one going up in California and it's an all glass church. Well, I guess people who live in glass houses shouldn't cast stones or something like that. You know, I, I read an article on that just recently and they, they got this mammoth thing going up to all the glass. Everything supposedly is of glass. Now, I, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but uh, anyway, that's what they're doing. Well, that's fine. That's, that's their thing. But boy, has Israel multiplied temples. We've got churches all over the place, but we've forgotten our maker. We don't serve God and obey God. We build churches all over the place. Now, the Jews are a little more realistic. They multiply tents cities. They put their trust in all of their armaments. Uh, they, they, they multiply their fence cities, their, their various armaments and munitions and all of the various things that they have. They multiply that kind of thing. God says, I'm going to send a fire upon these cities. You're going to find out your fence cities are not going to do you any good. So it goes on and it talks about the things that are going to, to transpire. Let's, let's go on over to the book of Amos. Better hurry along. Amos chapter 2, verse 6. For thus says the Eternal, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. They pat after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek, and a man and his father go in unto the same woman to profane my holy name. Now, what's that talking about? Uh, they sell the poor for a pair of shoes. Let, let, I want to read a little more out of the Jewish commentary. I think it perhaps uh, will help to amplify and to bring out some of these things. Amos chapter 2 talks about uh, uh, selling the poor for a pair of, sh uh, of shoes. This is a reference to the ancient legal procedure of the transfer of a shoe to symbolize the transfer of property. You remember the account given back in Ruth? Mr. Rosler referred to in the sermonette, you know, of how, uh, of course, the transaction that took place. And, and if you remember the story in the book of Ruth, when Boaz took over the right of the uh, kinsman redeemer and bought the land, uh, the other fellow took off his shoe and gave it to him. It symbolized the transfer of property. So the sense of this verse, and they've sold the poor for a pair of shoes, in other words, that exploiters cloak their unscrupulous transactions with legal formality. They went through the form. They went through the legal formality, but it all amounted to the same thing. They exploited. They swallowed up the poor. It goes on down. And they pant after the dust of, of the earth on the head of the poor. Uh, reading again from the Jewish commentary. Their land hunger is so great that they desire even the dust which rests on the poor man's head. You know, they're swallowing up everything around. They, uh, they swallow up the land that belongs to the poor and virtually uh, covet the, the dust of it that he has left on his head. You know, they're, they're, just, they're out to get, to get everything there is. So God says, uh, you know, the, so he talks about the greed and the corruption, the economic sin, the materialism, is one cheap indictment and the sexual immorality, the sexual looseness. These are two main things that God goes into. So he goes on and he talks about uh, this kind of thing here in Amos uh, chapter 2, going on over in Amos chapter 8, Amos chapter 8 and verse 4. Hear this, O you that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to, fa to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat? making the ephah small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. The Eternal has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will not forget any of their words. God says, O you that swallow up the needy, that make the poor of the land to fail. And he goes on, and he talks about making the ephah small and the shekel great. Now, the ephah was a measurement of produce, like a bushel. The shekel was a measurement of money, like a dollar. God, what's he talking about? What is the thing that oppresses the poor of the land more than any other factor in terms of the economic system that we have? That is inflation. 
And inflation is manufactured. And inflation is intentional, is intentional, and I can prove that not only from history and from fact, I can prove it from the scripture too in terms of what God says in, in terms of certain prophecy, uh, Babylon the Great and, and the economic aspects of that. I don't want to get into that, all, all of that today. But what is inflation? Selling less and less and getting more and more for it. God says you're making the ephah small and the shackle great. You're selling less and getting more. That is the cruelest tax of all, and those who pay it, those, who, who does it hit the hardest? Some of you sitting here in this room know those who are on fixed income, the widows, the fatherless, those that God says we ought to look out for, God, those that God says ought to be taken care of, the elderly, the poor of the land, those that are needy, are being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. God says, warn to them that make the, the ephah small and the shekel great, falsifying the balances by deceit. You know, it was interesting. This, this scripture came to my mind. I was up in Canada this summer, and, and I was noticing the prices up on the gas station. Uh, 21.9, 22.9. That wasn't gallons. That was liters. And they, they switched over. And I was talking with my father-in-law about it, and they, they switched over to the metric system. I was talking with him in the various measurements. You know, they don't sell half gallons of milk anymore. They sell two liter boxes. And, of course, it's not an exact equivalent. And you know what, of course, they took advantage of the opportunity to do was to kind of confuse the issue. They switched over to a different system of measurement. But if you get out and do all the calculations and compare back and forth, you find out they raised the price while they did it, and they stuck it to you a little more. But they changed the measurement and the price, and, and so people didn't realize, you know, they tried to make the boxes look... You, you take a two-liter box of milk and a, and a half-gallon box of milk, and you can't tell the difference unless you place them side by side. They made it look exactly the same. They priced it that way, too. Exactly the same. But it wasn't as much. Falsifying the balances by deceit. Just a whole deceitful attitude. We're going to, you know, we're going to gig them one way or the other. Just a, it's talking about an attitude, a concept that pervades. Well, uh, th this type of an attitude, oh, uh, hear this, oh, you that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, we're going to get, and we're going to get, and we're going to get. God says, I'm not going to forget. I'm not going to forget what you're doing. You may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes to sell the refuse of the wheat, willing to sell anything, willing to, uh, to make shady deals, this type of a, of a corrupt approach. You know, we're reaping the whirlwind on these things. God... God talks about in, in Amos chapter 3 and verse 9, he says, Behold the great tumults in the midst thereof, and the oppressions in the midst thereof, the great tumults, the civil strife that we are having in our nations, that we're having inside the United States, that we're having inside Canada, and inside Britain, and inside South Africa, inside Australia. The civil strife, all of the turmoil, the internal turmoil, the great tumults, in the land, in the midst thereof, inside. Our problems are internal problems. The problems of Israel are internal problems. When Ephraim saw his sickness, it is an internal problem. I want to read you a little bit. I mentioned in terms of inflation, and I think you need to understand a little bit about that. I have an article here from the Christian Science Monitor, which is very good, and it points up a little bit and explains something about it, because there are all kinds of ideas going around who causes inflation and what causes inflation. And, and there's only one, there's only one, it gets back to one aspect in terms of, of controlling inflation because you get back to the cause. Um, Congress has managed to balance the federal budget only once since 1960. You know, a rather dubious accomplishment. How, how would you like it? You know, if you and I tried to run, if you had run your financial affairs the way Congress runs the nation's, what would you, you know, you've managed to balance your, your budget once since 1960. <laughs> They'd have you locked up somewhere. Uh, you know, you, you would have had to file for bankruptcy or something. Sometimes the deficits have been small, but for the past five years, this is uh, written in 78, Congress has spent $30 billion to $60 billion a year more than it has taken in. If you and I did that, it would be called writing a hot check, you know. They arrest people for things like that. They prosecute them for things like that. Uh, of course, when the federal government has to pay it, uh, of course the federal government has to pay its bills even when it has a deficit. 
One way it does so is by creating new money. Instead, now, now they don't do this. You, you think, well, you know, just crank up the printing presses and print more. Well, no, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Instead of printing more currency, it does what amounts to the same thing. Actually, it's worse uh, in a roundabout way. First, the federal government sells government securities to the Federal Reserve Corporation. Now, the Federal Reserve, Reserve Corporation is a privately owned a quasi-government agency, but it is privately owned. It, 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 there, there are shares in the Federal Reserve System, and they're owned, you know, various, various bankers, and, and uh, it is the only corporation in the United States uh, whose uh, stockholder, you know, the the, uh, the uh, record of the stockholders is uh, is secret, and uh, you can't, you know, other other corporations you can you can investigate and you can find out who owns the stock. Not so with the Federal Reserve. It's the only one, and the secrecy of it is protected by law. Uh, and that's a different story, and it goes back to some things that happened back at the turn of the century. Uh, but uh, Anyway, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Government sells government securities to the Federal Reserve. In other words, they print up bonds, interest-bearing bonds, and they sell those bonds to the Federal Reserve. Now, the Federal Reserve is the one that creates the currency. If you look on your dollars, it says a Federal Reserve note. They're issued by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve pays for these securities by making a deposit in the name of the federal government and a federal reserve bank. They're the ones that create the money. And you, you read in the newspaper about the Fed is going to increase the supply of money or decrease the supply of money. The federal government goes to the federal reserve and, and they say, we need, you know, $10 billion. And so they, they print up $10 million worth of bonds. The federal reserve buys those bonds, but where do they get the money to buy it? They print them. See, they're the ones that run the press. They print the $10 billion. They deposit, you know, the way they do it, they take $10 billion in bonds, they deposit to the account of the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve Bank uh, $10 billion, and then the government writes checks on those $10 billion that the Federal Reserve just created for them. But the Federal Reserve then has $10 billion in bonds, interest-bearing bonds. Uh, as the Federal Government needs money, it simply writes checks on its Federal Reserve accounts. You know, how would you like to do that? Uh, you know, keep going down and, and doing that, all right? Thus, new dollars are created and placed into circulation in the economy, but every other dollar is worth less as a result because you've got more and more dollars ch chasing the same amount or even less goods. Now, that's not even the whole thing. That's not even the whole story. The article doesn't go on and, and amplify. But what does the Federal Reserve then do with that, uh, with, with those, that $10 billion of bonds that it has? Well, in the first place, you know what? The, the banks have to keep 10% and they can loan out nine, they can loan out nine dollars on every, uh, or, or what is it? Nine, nine to, uh, nine to one. They, they keep 10%. In other words, for the ten billion dollars which the federal government now has deposited in the Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve is able to loan out at interest 90 billion dollars. See, based on those reserves that it has, those assets. And collect the interest off of all of that. Then the $10 billion it has in bonds from the federal government, the federal government has to pay the interest on those bonds. And what the interest on $10 billion worth of bonds is? You know, do a little figuring. That, that mounts up to some money itself. All right. Uh, what it amounts to is thanks to inflation and the graduated income tax, Americans today, uh, Americans today pay 42% of their incomes in local, state, and federal taxes. Now, uh, inflation is an increase in the money supply which exceeds the increase in the value of goods and services produced in the economy. We see inflation as a general rise in prices or an erosion of the purchasing power of the dollar. But these are merely effects of inflation, effects of the growth of the money supply. Congress rarely votes to raise our taxes. It doesn't need to. If we simply keep up with inflation in our earnings, we move into higher tax brackets because of the graduated na nature of the federal income tax system. Now, you see, uh, the Federal Reserve does not have to worry about collecting its debt. The IRS is the collection agency. See, they make sure that the government uh, gets the money in to pay the, uh, to pay the interest. We're not paying on the national debt. We're simply paying interest on the national debt. Uh, this fiscal year of 78, Americans will pay $55 billion dollars in interest on the national debt. We're not even paying on that anymore. We're just paying the interest on the national debt, making interest on the national debt the third largest category of federal spending, spiraling inflation. Uh, 
Uh, but it goes on down talking about the fact that only government can increase the, the money supply, only government can stabilize it. It's, uh, you know, there are various things. There's a, an article here from U.S. News about the fact of federal debt fast approaching one trillion dollars. You know, that's, that's an astronomical figure that we can't even uh, comprehend. This is talking about, this was written in January 1978. It's, it's past the trillion mark now. The article soon going to be two years old. And it talks about the rapid rise in federal debt. And, and you can't see the figures on it, but look at the graph. Uh, figured from 1776 to 1978. You know, 200 years. And look at the, look at the rise. You know, it's going, it's peaking out. Well, it can't continue to go on that way. Uh, I want to, I want to read you a little bit from an old book, uh, printed back in 1924. And it's interesting, this is an article on money, and it's interesting from this standpoint how much times have changed. We're talking about 1924, what's that, 55, uh, 55 years ago. Uh, it talks about the fact that the first attempt, it's talking about money. The first attempt to fix value of pieces of metal used as money was by weighing them. Scales were used in drawing ancient bargains. So that's why God uses the analogy in Scripture, falsifying the balances uh, making the ephah small and the shekel great. That's, that's the symbolism that's involved because that was the early uh, way of, of fixing the price of money was by weighing, uh, by weighing. Now, I want to read you uh, just a paragraph on Rome. There was little money coming into the Roman treasuries in the latter days, but vast sums were being spent for luxury. Silks for the women were worth their weight in gold, and more than $400,000 annually went out of Rome to the east for splendid clothes, gems, spices, and oil. To offset this loss, the emperors, beginning with Nero, began to mix cheaper metals in the coin. It was the same state of things as if the President of the United States should take one-third of the silver out of our dollars and substitute ten, exclamation point, ten, T-I-N. At last, the denarius was only copper-coated with tin and was officially called no good by the government, which was a plain admission of bankruptcy. The gold coin was also reduced to almost half its original weight. Have you seen one of the new Susan B. Anthony dollars? This was written in 1924, and they wrote that as, boy, you know, can you imagine the emperor taking the, 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 the gold out of the coins and substituting copper? That would be just as ridiculous as the president taking the silver out of our coins and, and, and you know, making them out of tin instead. That's right, sure would. Same thing, isn't it? The thing is, you know, 55 years later, that's what we're doing. In 1924, that was, you know, that was crazy. They used that as an example, and people would look at that and think, boy, you know, isn't that crazy? Can you imagine someone doing such a thing? They couldn't then. We can now. You know, look at the quarters. Got, you know, the sand, it looked like a sandwich. You know, the copper in there, and got a little... Uh, you know, something on either side. The dollar, we've even made it smaller. We, 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 they, they have the dollar out and, uh, the new dollar. I, I haven't even seen one. Uh, I mean, they're not circulating too well. But anyway, uh, they're just barely, uh, larger than a quarter. And I think that's interesting because they're, you know, they should have made it about the size of a dime if they wanted to accurately reflect what's happened in the last few years. You know, it's incredible. And, and brethren, we need to understand, we need to realize, everyone does not suffer the effects of inflation the same way. Everyone does not suffer the effects of, of depression the same way. There are those who are exploiting the poor for gain. Now, it's interesting, there's an article here in U.S. News World Report about why an old theory of economic ups and downs worries the West. And it, it shows on, on graphs form kind of an up and down cycle of expansion and stagnation, and it goes up and down. The stagnation represents a time of depression and then expansion. And it's interesting that this is based on about a 50-year cycle, uh, bottomed out after the country began, bottomed out uh, in the late 1820s, bottomed out in the late 1870s, uh, bottomed out in, uh, you know, the early 1930s. Fifty years later, what would that bring us to? Sometime right 
in the near future. It's interesting, approximately every 50 years. You know, man is sure a lot smarter than God. Man has a way of figuring out a much better economic system than what God had. You know what God had every 50 years? God had a jubilee. Man, uh, you know, that's crazy. Have a jubilee, we'll have a depression every 50 years. That's a whole lot better. You know, why have an old jubilee when everybody's happy? Why don't we have a depression? Let it all, instead of all coming back to those uh, whose right it is, let, let it all go into the hands of a few. You know, some of you lived through the last depression. You know what happened. There were fortunes made in the depression. Oh, there were fortunes lost. Those were the ones that weren't in on the nose. There were those that came out of the depression multiplying their wealth in terms of actual holdings. God indicts our nation for involvement in many of these things and for allowing our government to be corrupted. God tells us that we and in Israel are in Babylon, a Babylonian system, and the whole system of uh, uh, our economic system goes back to Babylon. This is a very interesting book from that standpoint, written over 50 years ago, and it goes into the history of, of the economic system and is very, uh, very good in that way. It's been out of print for many years. It's the old Outline of Knowledge uh, series, which was, uh, uh, you know, in, vo uh, in vogue back at that time. But, you know, there, there are places uh, we can go on. We can go on to the book of Micah, Micah chapter 3. Verse 9, Hear this, I pray you, you son, you heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. That's what God has to say about our judicial system. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is, the, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Oh, we're a good people. We're a godly people. Oh, God is among us. We know that God won't let anything happen to us. We're such good, we're such good folk. Don't kid yourself. God says that this is an indictment in terms of our judicial system. He says that, that, that as he looks at it, we abhor judgment and pervert all equity. He says that we've got people who are in it for the money, whether judges, or whether even those that are supposed to claim to represent God, even the ministry. God, he said, God says, Therefore shall Zion be, uh, for your sake, be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps in the mountains of the house of, uh, as the high places of the forest. So God says that indictment is going to come on us. We see we can go on back uh, in uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 2. Hear, o you mount hear, you, O mountains, the eternal's controversy. You strong foundations of the earth, for the eternal has a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. And he goes on and he talks about what God has done. And it says, Will God be pleased, verse 7, with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You think God's going to be pleased with going through the ritual of religion? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the eternal require of you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The eternal's voice cries unto the city, and a man of wisdom shall see your name, hear you the rod, and who has appointed it. He goes on talking about various, uh, various indictments of the nation, going on back in, in Micah chapter 7 is it goes through and talks about, again, the, the problems. Verse 2, the good man is perished out of the earth. There is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Everybody's seeking to trip up everybody else. Uh, they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asks, the judge asks for a reward. The great man, he utters his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up, you know, in just all neat little package, all kind of chicanery. The best, the best of them is as a briar, the most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. You want to get involved in politics? You want to go out and elect old so-and-so, get him in? God says the best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. Now that's what God has to say about them. Maybe you think you know more and you're going to go out and get so-and-so elected. He's going to solve the problems. I'm going to tell you something. No, he's not. You know, Nebuchadnezzar learned that God said over nations whomsoever he would, sometimes even the basest of men. 
Nebuchadnezzar learned that lesson that God was the one that was really rule, ruling in the affairs of men and, and, and uh, you know, God would set up whoever he wanted, even the basest of men, and God's allowed some of the basest of men uh, to be in in many offices. And we're not going to affect that. So, verse 6, the son dishonors the father, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the, are the men of his own house. We've got family problems. We've got families tearing apart. We've got disrespect to children for parents. We've got a breakdown of the family. We've got the family, the American family, sacrificed on the altar of materialism in this nation. God says you've sown the wind and you're going to reap the whirlwind. And he talks about the results. He talks about the things that are going to come on. He talks about in Micah 3, 4, Then shall they cry unto the Eternal, and He will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doing. God says time's going to come when people are going to cry out, and, oh, woe is us, God help us, and God's not going to hear. He talks about in, in, in Amos chapter 4, the fact in, in, in verse 6, I'm going to give, I, I've given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places. Talks about in, chap, in, in verse 7, I've withheld the rain, in some places, and I cause it to rain on another city. One, pe- one piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. Two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water. You know, one place is flooded, and the other place has drought. But they were not satisfied. Verse 9, I've smitten you with blasting and mildew. Verse 10, I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. You are young men, have I slain with a sword? Verse 11, I've overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have you not returned unto me, says the Eternal. Therefore thus will I do unto you, O Israel, and because I will do this unto you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For lo, he that formed the mountains and created the wind and declared unto man what is his thought that makes the morning darkness and treads upon the high places of the earth, the Eternal, the God of hosts is his name. And we are a nation that has forgotten God. And we're a nation that has turned our back on God. And brethren, this nation has got to hear this message. And this nation, which has committed these sins, is going to have some lessons to learn. And God goes on and He talks about the captivity that's going to come, the things that are going to transpire in this nation, and the fact of the, the deep lessons and the difficult lessons that this nation is going to have to uh, is going to have to learn. God tells us in Hosea 14, O Israel, return unto the Eternal your God, for you have fallen by your iniquity. Take with you words and take to the Eternal, say unto Him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. Asher shall not save us, we will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our God, for in you the fatherless find mercy. You know, the time, our people are going to have to come and they're going to have to be brought down low to come to the point where they cry out to God and they mean it. And they realize, no, Germany's not going to save us. Our allies are not going to bail us out. We're not going to ride upon horses. We're not going to uh, assemble some vast armaments and some vast armada, some vast uh, airborne force or missiles or, or, or uh, whatever. Neither shall we say any more to the, to the works of our hands, to all of the material things we fixed our attention on. We, we, we realize that the things we make are not going to save us. We realize that our material possessions, that's not God. We realize that all the things we've set our affection on, that we've looked to for our deliverance, those things cannot save us. God says to our nation, prepare, O Israel, to meet your God, the eternal the maker of heaven and earth, that's his name, the one that formed the earth, the one that made everything that is, the one you've forgotten, the one you've thrown out of your school, the one you've thrown off the television and out of your media, the one you've taken out of your national life, the one that gave you everything that's worth having, every breath of air you breathe, the one that has given to you the choicest bounties of heaven, You've forgotten. You've gone a different way. You've sown the wind and you'll reap the whirlwind. 
Brethren, we need to realize this. Our nation collectively is in bondage. Our nation collectively is part and parcel of this Babylonish system. And if we want to dabble our toes in it, and if we want to get close to it and try to be in it, we need to understand that we, if we become partakers of the sins of this Babylonian system, we will be partakers in its place. God says, come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins. Be not partakers of her place. Don't get caught up in this idea of grasping of a covetous, lustful attitude toward, toward life. Don't allow that kind of thing to begin to come in and to permeate you. Don't take God's law lightly. Don't allow these things. God says when the nation repents, then he'll heal. Then he'll listen. He says, I'll heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from them. I'll be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as leaven. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as leaven. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of leaven. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. For me is your fruit found. Who is wise? He shall understand these things. You want to be wise, brethren? Better understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. Well, it boils down to something very simple. The ways of God are right. They're justice equity, love, mercy, the laws of God. The ways of the eternal are right. And the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Brethren, that's a lesson we need to drive home to ourselves. That's a lesson whether we be young or old, whether we be teenager or adult. That's a lesson that you need to make a part of you. The ways of God are right, teenagers, adults, children, whoever. The ways of God are right, and the just shall walk in them. You want to walk in God's ways, I don't care what your age is, you walk in God's ways and you'll be blessed, and you will be able to walk in them. But the transgressors, those who seek to go contrary to the way of God, shall fall therein. You know, God's ways are set down. And God makes us aware of something, and we have a precious not we have a precious message. We can't afford to draw back, we can't afford to allow our attention to be diverted from the work that God has has set before us. And you know, it's something that we need to we need to understand, we need to apply to us, realizing the seriousness of the calling that we have. Realizing that God sets out a message to our people. As a nation, we've repeated the sins of our ancient forebearers. We've virtually repeated their entire history. And what's interesting? But the same people in the same position, and they tend to do the same things. As we have followed in their sin, so we shall receive of their punishment. But brethren, that's not where the story ends. Because when we go through those prophecies, whether in Hosea, whether in Amos, whether in Micah, we see that that's not the end, because beyond the punishment ultimately lies national repentance and national salvation. And ahead of that lies a great and a glorious future for him, for all of us, for our children, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren, and for generations, 40 generations on down through the millennium. And we, all of us, young and old, have an opportunity to be a part of that. We have an opportunity to be a part of a work that is preparing for the ushering in of a new kingdom, a new government, a new era. The kingdom of God, the government of God, which is going to be restored to this earth. We have an opportunity to usher in that government and to restore God's way. Every one of us, young and old, have an opportunity to participate in that. Brethren, it's a precious thing. 
but it's a thing that the world does not, does not understand and does not esteem. But it's important. And it's something that if we keep it forefront of our minds, of our attitudes, of our affection, it's something that God will give us a part in, a part in sharing with all mankind.